Do you enjoy creepy horror stories? Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. Elder Care by Ron Ripley Mr. Johann V. Ritter, aged 97, lay on his back, mouth open slightly and revealing a number of yellowed teeth. His eyes were closed and darted back and forth beneath their lids in the thrall of REM sleep. Unlike many others in Nutmeg Pavilion Nursing Home, Mr. Ritter was not attached to any sort of equipment or monitoring device. His thin hair was still pale blonde, and his features were sharply defined by his almost translucent skin. He still walked without assistance of anything more than a cane, and he was tall enough that he needed to stoop when he passed through a doorway. The doctors and nurses referred to him as an old war horse, not merely because he was still alive and thriving as he moved towards the centennial mark. Pauline Thompson, who had been a third-shift nurse for three years and who had Mr. Ritter on her wing for all three of them, knew there was far more truth to the war horse reference than the others could understand. Mr. Ritter, Pauline knew, had been a soldier for the better part of his life. She walked closer to the man and gazed down at the thin arms resting atop his thick, dark green woolen blanket. On each index finger he wore a thick iron ring, each stamped with an image of an eye. The eye, he had once told her, was a sigil used to ward off evil. There were scars on the backs of his hands, on his wrists, and along his forearms up to where they vanished beneath the cuffs of his white sleep shirt. Pauline had asked about those scars once, and she had learned far more than she had wanted to. Are you all right? His voice, soft and accented by his Austrian heritage, took her by surprise and jump-started her heart. She felt the color rise to her cheeks. Yes, I'm sorry. He winked a runny blue eye at her. You have no need to apologize, my friend. As you know, I tend to sleep lightly. Did you take your sleep aid this evening? Mr. Ritter chuckled and used the controller by his side to raise the head of the bed. Of course I took it. It does not mean that it worked. Some nights it does, others it does not. When my nightmares are particularly bad, ah, well then I do not sleep as well as I would like. She glanced at the clock on his bureau, saw it was close to her break, and pulled a chair closer to him. It was her right, and few others in the home had the privilege. Sitting down, she smiled at him. Did you have nightmares again? I did. He pulled the cuffs of his sleeves down to his wrists, as if suddenly self-conscious of the scars and what they meant. Do you want to talk about it? He smiled at her. You are my mother confessor, yes? She nodded. Yes, you have been for a few years. He sighed, brought a shaky hand up to his head and pushed his hair back, more out of habit than necessity. I was thinking of Vietnam. He pronounced the name as two distinct words something her own father had never done when speaking of that war. When were you there? she asked. My father served from 67 to 69. Mr. Ritter chuckled. <laughs> I was recruited out of a prisoner of war camp in Africa in 1946. The French, they were desperate for soldiers with combat experience and they did not shy away from visiting members of the Africa Corps, imprisoned after the end of the Second World War. What? Pauline couldn't hide her surprise. Mr. Ritter nodded. Yes. It is not widely taught, or even mentioned, I discovered. But I fought as a mercenary from 46 until 1954, when the French eventually withdrew. Oh, Pauline shook her head. You were dreaming about 
Vietnam? Yes. There were some bad parts, of course, and so in my mind I was reliving them. His right hand reached out and picked up a small blue velvet bag from his bedstand. He turned it over several times, then wrapped his hand around it and smiled at her. There were times I did not think any of us would survive. Most of us did, thankfully. But these scars, he held up his hands, were from my last year in Vietnam. I have never been fond of knife fighting, and these injuries merely reinforced that dislike. Pauline tried to imagine Mr. Ritter with a knife and fighting someone, and she found she couldn't. Where did you go after Vietnam? Did you still work for the French? Oh, I did. They disbanded our unit and sent us on our merry way. I went back to Germany for a short time, but everyone I knew was dead, and the West German government was not especially thrilled to have a decorated member of the Africa Corps wandering the streets of Berlin or Bonn. They suggested I go on my way, and so I did. I traveled back to France, found a policeman, and told him I wanted to join the French Foreign Legion. Why did you tell a policeman? That is how it's done, he said with a wink. No matter who you are or what you have done, as soon as you make that request, off you go. Well, the Legion was willing to give me a chance, so I stayed with them until sixty-four. I'm always amazed at what you've done, Mr. Ritter, she smiled. I knew you had fought a lot, but not that you had been in the French Foreign Legion. Was it exciting? He smiled sadly at her. It was terrifying at times. They have a saying, and it is true, you march or you die. Wow. He nodded, took a deep breath and sighed. Well, Pauline, I have a favor to ask of you. Curious, she leaned forward. What is it? Mr. Ritter opened his hand and showed her the blue velvet bag. This is extremely important to me, and I am going to ask that you get rid of it. She felt her eyes widen, and she leaned back. What? It is a dangerous item, Pauline. Terribly dangerous. I do not want it here. Not any more. I, I cannot control it, should something happen. Do you understand? He's losing his mind now, she thought, hiding her sadness. This is the first sign of dementia, or something worse. I understand. How do you want me to get rid of it? He smiled at her, relief plain on his face. You must take it to running water. The deeper, the better. Cast it into the water and turn your back on it. That is all. Do you understand? Yes. She extended her hand and he hesitated a fraction of a second before he let go of it. The bag was heavier than she thought and uncomfortably cold, despite having been in his hand. Will you do it when you leave work? She nodded. On my way home, I have to pass over the Thames River. I'll pull over and throw it in. His entire body relaxed, and he nodded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pauline. Remember, throw it right in. Do not open it, please. I won't open it, I promise. Go to sleep now, Mr. Ritter. I'll see you tomorrow. He closed his eyes and smiled again. Pauline stood up and pushed the chair back into its place, dropping the velvet bag into the breast pocket of her scrubs. She walked back out to the nurse's station, picked up the chart, and checked off that she had done her rounds. Pauline hummed as she put in notes about various patients, and when she reached Mr. Ritter's name, she put down his request that she get rid of his blue velvet bag.
All the staff knew he had it, and for it to suddenly vanish would draw more attention than the note itself would. She shivered and realized the bag was still cold, and it was sending a chill through her, even through the thick fabric of her top. Frowning, she took it out of her pocket and set it down behind the counter of the station. She placed the clipboard with the notes on it beside the velvet bag. I should probably make a quick run to the bathroom before I do any paperwork. She glanced around, wondering where Maggie, her third shift partner, had gotten off to. Probably grabbing a quick smoke, she realized. Leaning against the station, she drummed her fingers on the desk, the pressure in her bladder growing as the minutes ticked by. Finally, after almost ten minutes, Maggie walked in with a scowl on her face. Hey, Pauline called. I'm heading to the bathroom. Maggie waved her on, and Pauline hurried off. Within a few minutes, she was finished and feeling better when she stepped out of the staff bathroom. Maggie was bent over the desk. Her back turned to Pauline as she studied something. Everything okay? Pauline asked as she drew closer. Don't know. Do you know what this is? Maggie held up a small object wrapped in what looked like metal. No idea. Can I see it? Maggie dropped the item into the palm of her outstretched hand, and Pauline winced at the chill that pulsated out of it. The object was the size of a regular six-sided die, and the metal was pliable. Curious, she pushed it, finding a nearly hidden seam. Spreading it open, Pauline caught sight of what looked like a tooth. Where the hell did you get this? She dropped the lead to the desk and held up an incisor that was almost certainly human. It was in this pouch here. Maggie picked up Mr. Ritter's blue velvet bag. Why did you open that? Pauline snatched the bag out of Maggie's hand. I wanted to know what it was and why it was on the desk. Maggie, it was with my clipboard. Her co-worker started to argue, then blushed as she looked down, evidently seeing the clipboard for the first time. Oh, I'm sorry, Pauline. I wasn't thinking. I was arguing with John about the baby again. It's not mine. Pauline dropped the tooth into the bag and cinched it closed. It belongs to Mr. Ritter. He asked me to get rid of it for him. Maggie shivered with revulsion. That's so disgusting. I wonder who he killed for it. Maggie! What? You know he probably did. He's a damned Nazi. Pauline glared at her. He was a soldier, Maggie. It doesn't automatically make him a Nazi. It sure as hell doesn't disqualify him. Pauline rolled her eyes. Something crashed in the room across from them. Without another word, the two women raced into the room and found the television, which had been mounted to the wall, on the floor. The occupants, a pair of 79-year-old twin sisters, lay in their beds, unmoved by the noise. How did that happen? Maggie's voice was hardly above a whisper. Pauline shook her head and walked to Emma, the closest sister. The old woman's eyes were closed, her head turned toward her twin. Pauline looked at Abby, the twin, and saw she was in an almost identical posture. Something's wrong, she thought. Maggie, can you check Abby, please? Pauline picked up Emma's wrist and sought the woman's pulse. There wasn't one. I don't have a pulse, Pauline. Me neither. Damn it. I'll call downstairs, get Tony up here to confirm it. Maggie walked toward the door and it slammed shut plunging them into darkness. Pauline took a small pen light from her cargo jeans pocket, turned it on, and flashed it around the room. She didn't see anyone or any reason for the door to have closed. A moment later, Maggie's own light joined hers. Together they advanced toward the large bathroom, the door to which was standing wide open. They went in and found it was empty. Shaking her head, Pauline reached for the door out of the room, and the pen lights died. Beside her, she heard Maggie try the light switch. The overhead lamp flickered into life, and then the bulb popped and went out. Fear and anger gripped Pauline as she took hold of the door latch and wrenched it down, pulling back at the same time. 
She and Maggie looked out into the main hall, which was lit only by the emergency lights. The air was cold enough for their breath to be seen, and when Pauline looked at Maggie, she could see fear in the other woman's face. We'll go together to check the rooms, Pauline told her. Okay? Maggie nodded. Pauline turned to the right, past the community room, and entered the next patient's room. It was a single, occupied by a recent arrival named Gary Yost. His loud snores told them he was alive and well. They backed out of the room, started towards the next, and heard a hideous scream from further down the hall. Pauline took the lead as she and Maggie sprinted, the scream transforming into a prolonged shriek. The sound came from several doors up on the left, and as Pauline sprang forward to launch herself over the threshold, the door slammed closed. It caught her in a chest and sent her crashing backward to the floor and gasping for air. Maggie was beside her a moment later, her voice barely audible below the ringing in Pauline's ears. Go! Pauline waved the woman away. Go! Maggie nodded, got to her feet, and threw open the door. She plunged into the darkened room, and the door slammed shut behind her. Maggie's shrieks joined the patients. Still struggling to breathe, Pauline used the wall to help get to her feet. Sound rushed back into her ears, and as she watched, the door to the room in front of her shook in its casing, and Maggie's cries ceased. No! Pauline staggered forward, grabbed hold of the latch, and pushed it down as she put her shoulder against the door. Groaning with the effort, she managed to get it open enough to step into the room and to see Maggie's crumpled form on the floor, wedged between the door and the wall. A quick glance at Maggie's face showed she was dead. A distant clinical voice in Pauline's head cataloged the injuries. Broken nose, shattered orbital sockets, forehead crushed, frontal lobe is clearly visible, C-spine vertebrae protruding from skin. Pauline struggled against the numbness of shock as she looked at the patients. Both were in their beds, their heads twisted around completely. Their names escaped her and she turned her back on the gathered corpses. She let the door close behind her, and she heard other screams from further down the wing. Pauline turned toward them, and she saw the emergency exit at the end of the hall open. Tony came into view, a flashlight in one hand and an emergency bag in the other. Pauline, are you okay? We tried reaching you. His voice was cut off as he was grabbed by an unseen force and lifted into the air. Tony's eyes widened, shock spreading across his youthful face. The flashlight went dead, and in the flickering glow of the emergency lights, Pauline watched his mouth open in a wordless scream. Unable to move, she saw his eyes get pushed into his head, blood exploding out as each orbit was scooped out. The emergency bag was torn from his hand and thrown at her, striking her in the legs as she failed to move out of the way in time. As she fell, she saw his arm wrenched out of the socket, dangling unnaturally from the short sleeve top he wore. Tony! She crawled forward, her body refusing to allow her to stand. Her eyes never left his face, and as she watched, unable to reach him in time, his jaw was pushed slowly toward the ceiling. His head tilted back, his Adam's apple protruding sharply. Tony screamed again, and then went silent as his neck snapped. For a heartbeat, his body hung limp in the air, arms and legs dangling obscenely. Then he was dropped, striking the tiled floor as nothing more than a bag of rotting meat. Pauline stopped and stared, her mind refusing to comprehend or accept what was occurring around her. More screams exploded in the stillness of the wing, and for the first time she heard the fearful cries of those patients who were still alive. Get up! she commanded. Get up! Pauline did so, swaying from side to side as she tried to remain balanced. She took a step toward the scream of someone being murdered. Then she shook her head. That person is as good as dead. I know this. I have to save someone else. This is triage. That's all it is. She recalled her youth when she had done her practical in emergency medicine at Catholic Medical Center in Manchester, New Hampshire. 
and the old sister who had been a nurse longer than Pauline's parents had been alive. Save those you can save. Comfort the dying. It is all you can do, the sister had told her. If you learn nothing other than this, you will know more than most. Pauline turned away from death and sought out those still living. She took several steps towards the nurse's station and saw Mr. Ritter totter out of his room. He was dressed in his nightshirt, his thin, bare legs protruding from the hem. On his feet were well-worn slippers, and in his right hand, he gripped the handle of a cane upon which he leaned heavily. He stared past Pauline toward the sounds of murder. His face was hard, his eyes unflinching. After a moment, he looked at Pauline. What happened to my blue velvet bag? His voice was calm, as though he was asking if she had seen the Sunday paper. Maggie opened it, Pauline explained. She found a tooth in the lead. She pointed to the desk. Where is the lead? And where is the tooth, Pauline? He walked towards her, his eyes darting occasionally from her to over her shoulder. The sounds of items breaking and new screams caused her to flinch. They are on the desk, Mr. Ritter. He reached the nurse's station and nodded. Ah, so they are. So they are. See good. Pauline let out a scream of pain and surprise as something struck her in the back and propelled her into Mr. Ritter. They fell to the floor together, and she realized she couldn't move. She had difficulty breathing. Pauline tried to move, but Mr. Ritter shook his head. You are hurt, he whispered. Stay still, as still as you can. She hissed in pain as he slid her off his chest. A voice spoke from behind her, but she couldn't turn to look, and she didn't know what the person said. It was a language she had never heard before, but evidently it was one that Mr. Ritter had, for he answered the person in kind. She turned her head enough to see his face, which was thrown into sharp relief as the emergency light near him shined upon him. The unseen speaker laughed, and a prosthetic arm flew across her field of vision, nearly hitting Mr. Ritter's head. He snarled and spoke with such vehemence that she knew he was swearing. The person behind her screamed and more objects were hurled at Mr. Ritter, none of which struck him. It was as though the speaker wanted to harm him, but couldn't bring themselves to do it. Where are the police? Pauline wondered. Where's the fire department? Every alarm in the world should have gone off by now. She tried to move again and sobbed. The pain in her back sent a shock through her entire chest, and in a moment she knew why. She could feel something scrape the floor when she breathed too deeply. Fighting back panic, she reached up with her right hand and felt the tip of a piece of metal protruding through her left shoulder and catching on a groove in the tiled floor. Mr. Ritter yelled in the foreign language and made a gesture with his hands that was unmistakable, regardless of the spoken word. Come and get me. The speaker did. As she watched, Pauline saw a figure hurtle past her. It was a woman, clad in black pants and shirt, long glistening black hair pulled into a ponytail. The woman was barefoot and empty-handed as she attacked Mr. Ritter. Her blows were powerful, rocking him back on his heels, but he stood there and took the abuse she gave him. I must have a head injury, Pauline thought, watching the fight. I think I can see through her. Is there a gas leak? Am I really seeing this? Is this happening? Or am I in some coma? The woman continued to lash out at Mr. Ritter, every blow landing. He never raised a hand against her, yet the woman struck him in the face and on the head. She punched his shoulders with enough force to drop him to his knees. Blow after blow landed against his face and chest, but he never fought back. Instead, he let his chin drop and he stared at the floor. Finally, after what seemed like an interminable amount of time, the woman stopped. She stood before Mr. Ritter and spoke softly to him in her own language. He nodded and answered her. She muttered to him and he shook his head. The woman raised her voice and he shrugged. An expression of unmistakable anger 
settled onto her small, sharp features, and she yelled at him. Grimacing, Mr. Ritter got to his feet and looked down at her. He was nearly two feet taller than the woman. She pointed at him, hissed a word at him, and he struck her. His large right hand passed through her, and the woman vanished. Pauline blinked, confused. Mr. Ritter lunged for the desk, reached over it, and snatched up the bag and the lead. The woman appeared behind him and screamed. He didn't look as he gave her a backhand that caused her to disappear again. Pauline watched as he opened the velvet bag and shook the tooth out. He pressed it into the lead as the woman lunged out of a shadow. Mr. Ritter didn't move as he folded the lead over the tooth, causing the woman in black to vanish. He stood there for a moment, looking at the small bit of lead in his hand. Then he dropped the blue velvet bag to the floor and knelt down beside Pauline. Be calm, my friend. She nodded and bit back a scream as he turned her onto her back, supporting her. You are gravely injured, I am afraid. Call for an ambulance. Her voice was cracked and broken. Do you see this? He held up the piece of lead, and she nodded. This is a tooth from my lover. I did not know she was a member of the Viet Cong, you see. When I found out, I was forced to kill her. It broke my heart. So to remember her, I took an incisor. I carried it for nearly a year before she came back as a ghost. She tried to kill me several times, and she killed several of my men before I finally learned how to control her. Oh, I knew how to stop her. Iron is what does it. But control, that is something different. Lead binds them if you do it well. I thought that if I had you throw her tooth into a river, I would be dead before she could be freed by time. Hubris, my friend, it makes liars of us all, does it not? Please, call for help, he shook his head. That I cannot do. No one can know of this. You are Jewish, are you not, my friend? What? Fear spiked her heart. No, no, he can't be a Nazi, not Mr. Ritter, not after all this time. Something must have shone in her eyes. No, I am not a Nazi, my friend. I only ask because I know that those of the Jewish faith do not have autopsies, and that is what I needed, I think. A lack of investigation. Don't you agree? She opened her mouth to speak, and he dropped the lead into her mouth. Her eyes widened with horror, and before she could try to spit it out, he clamped a large hand over her mouth and pinched her nose closed, forcing her to swallow it. As soon as she had, he let go, holding her gently as she coughed and wheezed. I know, I know. I am terribly sorry, my friend. It is necessary. They will not empty your stomach. They will leave your body alone. This wound isn't bad enough to kill me, she gasped. No, it is not. Mr. Johann V. Ritter placed his hand over her mouth, pinched her nose closed, and whispered, I am sorry, my friend, truly sorry. In the distance, Pauline heard the wail of sirens, and she knew they would be too late. Click the link in the description or search Scare Street on Audible for a list of all our bone-chilling titles. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. See you in the shadows.